when a series of missionary photographs arrived in England in the late 19th century, they caused outrage. The mutilations had been strategically photographed against white for maximum impact. The children came from the Congo, but the man accused of their suffering was white, European, and royal. For almost a hundred years, evidence has lain dormant of one of the greatest mass murders. Millions of Africans died in one man's quest for wealth and glory. Until Adolf Hitler arrived on the scene, the European standard for cruelty was set by a king. Leopold II, King of the Belgians, was the personal owner of one million square miles of Central Africa and king sovereign of 20 million Africans. In the 1880s and 90s, the world outside Africa wanted rubber for its new bicycle and car industries, and Leopold's Congo Free State had the world's largest supply of wild rubber. The king had struck gold, black gold. He was determined to get as much rubber to Europe as he could, and as fast as he could. The rubber in this district has cost hundreds of lives. And the scenes I have witnessed while unable to help the oppressed have been almost enough to make me wish that I were dead. Over a period of 20 years, Leopold turned the Congo into a vast labor camp 80 times the size of Belgium, in the process making himself into one of the richest men in the world. As the number of deaths grew, so did his profits. This rubber traffic is steeped in blood. And were the natives to rise and sweep every white person on the upper Congo into eternity, there would still be left a fearful balance to their credit. But the longer the king stayed in the Congo, the greater the evidence against him. Missionaries, travelers, and the victims all added to the clamor for the king to be stopped. Nasi Astonishingly, for the time, there were calls for Leopold to be hanged at the new International Court of Justice in The Hague. If there were such thing as criminal prosecutions in international affairs, then assuredly a true bill would be found against the sovereign who obtained not a paltry sum of money, but a whole empire by false pretenses. Instead of being hanged, Leopold was reinvented as a great humanitarian king, a great civilizer. The Congolese historian Elikia Ambakolo believes that the truth about Leopold's crimes was deliberately hidden to protect Belgium and Belgian interests in the Congo. This film details the charges against King Leopold and reveals a cover-up of monumental proportions. The signs of the wealth that Leopold amassed are everywhere in Brussels and on an enormous scale. The king built the Saint-Contenaire to celebrate the country's 50th anniversary. 
it's become part of the national identity. The Saint Cantonair is a very uh, expressive symbol of, of Belgium and of the proud Belgium. In fact, King Leopold paid for it with his own money, but he didn't say so openly because it was, this would prove that, first of all, he had a lot of money. People would ask questions where it came from, and then he would have to admit that it came from the Congo. So the Saint Cantonair symbolizes this lie about Belgium and about the royal implication in politics about the colonial exploitation. C'est incroyable de voir tous ces embellissements, toutes ces réalisations, toutes ces richesses, sans une seule référence au Congo et aux Congolais. Après tout, si Léopold II a pu entreprendre tout ceci, c'est grâce à la richesse du Congo, au sang des Congolais, aux souffrances des Congolais, à l'exploitation du Congo. C'est incroyable, cette manie d'effacer le Congo. The Royal Museum for Central Africa was also built by Leopold and paid for with Congo money. It's a vision of Africa through Leopold's eyes and with a huge dose of homage. Homage to Leopold, who gave the Belgians a colony, and homage to the pioneers who died carrying out the king's wishes. White conquest is mythologized as benevolence, as bringing civilization to the Congo. On m'accuse d'avoir fait fusiller un indigène, ligoté à un arbre. Je suis également accusé d'avoir mené une attaque contre un village, au cours de laquelle beaucoup de Noirs ont été tués. On m'accuse d'ailleurs, ainsi que cinq autres Blancs, d'avoir tué 150 personnes, d'avoir pendu en forme de croix des femmes et des enfants, ainsi que d'avoir coupé les organes génitaux et les têtes d'hommes pour les attacher aux palissades. There is no doubt that a lot of things happened in Congo Free State under King Leopold II that are clearly unacceptable, that are even scandalous. But one has to look at uh, the sign of the times and the sort of uh, none of the colonial powers in those days were, were really softies and had a fairly human approach. I mean, only look at what the Brits and the French and the Dutch who introduced slave trade or the Germans were doing. So it's not a period of which we can be very proud, but one has to look at it in a particular perspective of time and of history. Leopold's Congo was a prison state. Africans had no rights, no justice, and no freedom. They were there to serve a voracious European king. Thousands of miles away, Leopold was content that the end always justified the means, and the end was to make money. Leopold dominated the Congo for a quarter of a century. But in the last years of his reign, the Congo was handed over to the Belgian state, which gratefully kept control in his name until 1960. The king no longer has pride of place. The Congo is independent. Leopoldville is now Kinshasa, and Leopold is in a junkyard. For me, it was Leopold II in person. Not the statue of Leopold II, but Leopold II. So big, so high, who seemed to be there to crush me, to dominate me. And then, no question of passing in front of the horse. Il fallait passer derrière. C'est comme si enfin, je me sentais obligé de respirer l'odeur des excréments du cheval de Léopold II. Après l'indépendance, il était encore là. Enfin, C'était une vraie provocation. 
Et puis enfin est arrivé le jour où je suis là et je vois des jeunes gens tirer Léopold II. Une revanche, une joie de voir enfin ce scandale par terre, là où il devait se trouver. But it takes more than destroying symbols to wipe out generations of foreign occupation. Leopold once wrote, a people which is content with its homeland and which dreads even the shadow of a conflict lacks the characteristics of a superior race. A Belgian officer had been dispatched with a force of some 50 or 60 men to capture a chief. In rummaging in the huts for plunder, they came upon two women, a mother and daughter, who had not had the time to get away. They were brought up before the officer, who demanded of them where the chief was in hiding. They either did not know or would not tell. He ordered them to be secured and laid out on the ground. And a stalwart soldier then proceeded to administer 50 strokes of the chicot to each. The flogging continued until each had received 200 lashes. Finally, this Belgian officer ordered his men to cut off the breasts of the women and left them to die where they lay. In Brussels, the statues of Leopold have not been pulled down. The old king is still part of a Belgian dynasty. Leopold's Saxe-Coburg pedigree was impeccable. His father, Leopold I, was Queen Victoria's uncle his mother, Louise Marie d'Orléans, the eldest daughter of the French king. His father hadn't much time for the young prince, describing him as the little tyrant, and his mother remarked unkindly how he was disfigured by his enormous nose, which gives him a bird-like air. I think his mother was rather insignificant uh, there, and maybe also this explains uh, a lot about his character the lack of love, the lack of affection, uh, which he compensated by saying that affection didn't bother him or uh, as he told at the end of his life when he was very unpopular, uh, that he was not interested in popularity. Of course, this was a way of saying, I'm very sad about the fact that I'm not popular. Leopold's arranged marriage to the 16-year-old Archduchess Maria Theresa was a disaster. A society lady summed up the match as being between a stable boy and a nun. And by none, she meant Leopold. The couple had to get sex advice from Aunt Victoria and Uncle Albert on a visit to London. They did have three daughters. Their son died young, so there was no surviving male heir. At the start of his reign, Leopold proclaimed, my ambition is to make Belgium greater, stronger, and more beautiful. He had no doubts that the country needed improving. Leopold did always complain that Belgium was a small country with small people, but he certainly wasn't a small king. I mean, not only was he extremely tall, but I think he had enormous ambitions for himself. And I think he felt resentment about his relatively low and humble role within the Saxe-Coburg dynasty. Uh, I mean, he really wasn't very important compared with Victoria, um, compared with the Kaiser. And I think that he therefore felt that personally, if you like. I mean, he was somebody for whom l'État was definitely c'est moi, and therefore the elevation of Belgium was necessarily the elevation of himself. Like his father, Leopold believed that having a colony was the way to achieve greatness. Leopold I made over 50 attempts to get a colony, all to no avail. His son was going to be more successful. Even before Leopold became king, he had sent the Belgian finance minister a piece of marble from the Acropolis inscribed, Belgium must have a colony. Leopold II lived in the second half of the 19th century, and in fact was he 100 years later on the idea 
Engeland, of Groot-Brittannië als je wilt, Frankrijk, Nederland, op dat moment in het laatste kwartaal van de 19e eeuw, dachten unaniem dat een kolonie geen geld moest opbrengen op de eerste plaats voor het moederland, maar dat het moederland zelf moest geld investeren en met de winst die daar gemaakt werd, ter plaatse moest houden voor de administratie, voor het leger, voor de ordehandhaving en voor de Inlandse bevolking. En nu Leopold II dacht er helemaal niet aan. Het moest geld opbrengen voor het moederland en niet vice versa. Leopold set about scouring the globe. He tried Sarawak, the New Hebrides, the Fiji Islands and the Philippines until there was practically nowhere else left for him to look apart from one place. At the start of Leopold's reign, the Congo was unknown territory to Europeans. For Leopold, it represented his last chance. The Congo was to be his new colony at any cost. The man who was going to make this possible was Henry Morton Stanley. A former workhouse boy from Wales, he had made himself into one of the greatest explorers of the age and one of the roughest. His expedition to cross Africa from east to west was the most expensive ever undertaken. Stanley, coming from the east, was getting into the Congo through the back door. No white man had ever crossed the continent before. Stanley would have to walk or canoe 7,000 miles. Leopold knew that if Stanley succeeded, he would effectively open up the Congo. In the 19th century, London was the epicenter of colonization. At Claridge's, Leopold entertained explorers, geographers and generals, all to sell his Congo venture. He went to see his aunt Victoria and gave the queen more of the same spin. He told her, I have sought to meet those most interested in bringing civilization to Africa. Back home, he organized a geographical conference, turning his palace into a luxury hotel for the delegates and supervising every detail. He declared that his aims in Africa were completely charitable and philanthropic. The Congo was about to receive all the benefits of civilization and Christianity. Met een ook, omdat hij hier in een christelijk land zat, was dat ook maar goed meegenomen dat hij daar dan meteen wel het christendom wilde helpen propageren. Alhoewel wij toch weten dat hij zo geen overtuigd uh, christen was. Maar goed, dat is een persoonlijke zaak. Each of the conference delegates received a portrait of the king. Leopold knew exactly how to use snobbery as a weapon. The news that Stanley had successfully crossed Africa was the signal for Leopold to act. In his scrawling handwriting, he wrote to an aide that he did not want to miss out on this magnificent African cake. Stanley today, like Leopold, is unwanted in Kinshasa. But in 1887, Stanley was the man that the king needed. Under the guise of a charitable organization, the International Africa Association, Leopold hired Stanley to make the Congo fit for a king. La réputation de Stanley est celle d'un bâtisseur, d'un pacificateur, d'un constructeur. En réalité, ce qu'il a fait, c'est d'abord de casser, de briser, de détruire tout ce qui existait avant. Et à la place, c'est vrai qu'il construit quelque chose, quelque chose de nouveau, une logique marchande et une logique politique. Et ce nouveau système, il le met au service de l'Occident et en particulier au service du roi Léopold II. Stanley established a network of steamers, built roads and bridges, and even a small railway. He soon earned the name Bula Matadi, the smasher of rocks. 
But behind Stanley's back, Leopold was changing the Charitable African Association into a commercial company. His new Congo Association would be run exclusively for profit. He wrote to an aide, care must be taken not to let it be obvious that the Congo Association and the African Association are different. The public doesn't grasp that. The king issued new orders. He now wanted official treaties to show that the Congo belonged to him. Stanley was told to get the chiefs to sign up. Stanley's men used bribes and trickery to obtain the Congolese chief's agreement. They claimed that the white man even had power over the sun. It's unscrupulous though Leopold was, he realized that he needed to have some veil of legality. And Leopold was very clever. He'd investigated the precedents for this. He'd looked at the sultans of, of Sarawak. He'd looked at North American Indians. He'd looked even at some of the Indian treaties that the British had established. And he realized that with these bits of paper, if he ever came to be challenged, as he was later, over his authority over this territory, he would be able to produce these ostensible contracts. So Stanley was absolutely crucial in achieving that. <laughs> Having tricked the Africans, the king now set about convincing the European powers that he should be allowed to own this vast African colony. This time, it wasn't magic, it was diplomacy. By 1884, the great powers were all lined up in Berlin to hand over the Congo to the king. No Africans were invited. Ce document, c'est l'acte général de la conférence du Congo, publié le 26 février 1885 à Berlin. Ce document est connu dans l'histoire comme étant l'acte général de la conférence de Berlin. Léopold II, roi de Belge, n'était pas présent à Berlin. The conference gave Leopold everything he wanted. It's very remarkable to see that King Leopold managed to trick the great powers at that time. He promised that everybody would have access to that, that it would be free trade, that if there was anything to be gained, that everybody could participate in the loot. And there was quite some remorse afterwards in other countries that he got away with it, but he did. Le Congo est à peine reconnu par les grandes puissances comme propriété personnelle de Léopold II que le roi met en branle sa machine infernale. Dès le 1er juillet 1885, un décret stipule que toutes les terres vacantes, les terres vacantes, sont propriété de l'État. En 1991 et en 1992, d'autres décrets vont déclarer les produits de la forêt appartenant exclusivement à l'État. Et les indigènes ne peuvent pas les exploiter, sauf pour l'État. Donc, euh, en un tour de main, Léopold II a dépouillé les Africains de tous leurs biens et transformé le Congo en un vaste camp de travail forcé. To enforce his rule, the sovereign king had created an army. In time, it would be 16,000 strong, equipped with modern Belgian-made automatic rifles. The novelist Joseph Conrad was in the Congo Free State from the start. As a result of what he saw there, he wrote Heart of Darkness. They grabbed what they could get for the sake of what was to be got. It was just robbery with violence aggravated murder on a great scale, as is very proper for those who tackle a darkness. Bangoba zaki na mindoki. Okoki kobuna na yete. Bakobete bino masashi lokola nyama. Koboma bato ebele, 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 ebele. Bakovanda kandako te. Bakovanda kawabele kuna bui. Na zamba lokola nyama. Thank you. 
fear, like forced labor, was an integral part of the king's plans to make the Congo profitable. To administer his new territory, Leopold appointed executives in Brussels and a governor general in the Congo. But in fact, he ran it himself. His agents, his soldiers, carried out his wishes. The conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. Despite Leopold's armed soldiers and his labor camp methods, the Congo was not paying its way, and it was crippling Leopold's finances. As the months went by, the king was getting increasingly desperate. What saved Leopold was the demand for cars and bicycles. When John Dunlop, an obscure Scottish vet, invented the first pneumatic tyre, suddenly there was a huge market for rubber. And the Congo had rubber. In the years to come, there would be competition from rubber plantations in Asia and South America, but for now, the king had the market all to himself. The more rubber he could get to Europe before the new plantations came on stream, the greater the killing. Leopold combined the mind of a businessman and entrepreneur on one side and the mind of a political megalomaniac on the other side, and the two are very much linked together. Certainly, in that time, the second half of the 19th century, there's a clear link between economic power and political power. If you wanted to mean something, you had to have a lot of money, and that was what he intended to do with the Congo. For Leopold, transforming his new assets into cash simply meant ratcheting up the level of force. Villages in the rubber areas were set heavy targets and punished violently for refusal or failure to deliver. The reign of terror had begun. Dix avril 1895. Six indigènes tués. Village livré aux flammes. Déjeuner puis retour. 17 avril 1895. Parti avec 80 hommes pour Bauru. Une quinzaine de personnes tuées. 25 avril. Arrivé à Iteke. Brûler le village ainsi que Yambi. Ilongo. Brûler le village et tuer un indigène. Arrivé à Bakolo à 16h. Brûler. Arrivé à Yabumba à 11h40, je fais brûler le village. Arrivé à Likombe à 3h, tout à coup nous sommes attaqués. Deux soldats sont tués à côté de moi. Après quelques instants d'une fusillade bien nourrie, les indigènes prennent la fuite en laissant 13 des leurs sur le terrain. Je fais mettre le feu aux cases. Oui, juin. Je me dirige ensuite sur Yamapete. Je fais incendier le village. Après un bon déjeuner, nous rentrons en triomphe à Bazoko avec nos sanglants trophées. 10 juin, nous trouvons Yambisi. Nous envoyons plusieurs groupes de soldats battre la plaine. Ils reviennent quelques heures après avec 11 têtes et 9 prisonniers. Le 22 juin, on nous amène trois prisonniers dans la matinée. Trois autres vers le soir et trois têtes sont apportées. 
Un homme de bonne année, parcourant la forêt en appelant un grand cri sa femme et son enfant égaré, reçoit une balle d'une de nos sentinelles. On nous apporte sa tête. Jamais j'ai vu une telle expression de désespoir, d'effarement. Nous faisons incendier Yambisi. Ik denk dat inderdaad Leopold II de morele verantwoordelijkheid draagt voor wat binnen het systeem waar hij achter stond en dat hij hem heeft georganiseerd, ja, dat hij daar de morele verantwoordelijkheid voor draagt. Natuurlijk, dat is, dat is duidelijk. King Leopold certainly did not deliberately go into sort of murder or whatever. King Leopold was part of, of a regime and part of an economic sort of system that basically considered that part of the work as his private property and that he could rule as he wished. And King Leopold also, he was a man of vision. You can strongly disagree with his vision, but he did have a vision. And Congo, of course, whether you want it or not, but has meant a lot to the Belgian economy. So, For Belgium, there has been huge benefits to the involvement in Central Africa. In Leopold's time, the main witnesses to the atrocities were the missionaries. Living in the rubber districts meant it was impossible for them not to see what was going on. On December the 23rd, 1893, The state sent down some canoes under cover of night to the town of Ikengo. The people were quietly sleeping in their beds when they heard a shot fired and ran out to see what was the matter. Finding the soldiers had surrounded the town, their only thought was to escape. As they ran out of their homes, men, women and children, they were ruthlessly shot down. Their town was utterly destroyed and is a ruin unto this day. The only reason for this fight was that the people had failed to bring in food to the state upon that one day. At first, the missionaries wrote privately to each other about the cruelties they had seen traveling around their areas. But after a while, they started writing to their home missions. The poor people are crying out against the cruel oppression of the state, and well they might. I can scarcely keep my tongue silent when I hear of and see such villainy. In 1895, a missionary on leave in London did go public, but was forced to remain anonymous. He feared for his safety when he went back. By now, the missionaries knew all too well the severity of the punishments the state handed out. They saw how villagers were flogged with the shikot, a whip made of rhinoceros hide dried in the sun till it could rip a man's skin to shreds. They saw men tortured to death with burning kopal. A missionary described how the soldier found horrible pleasure in pouring the kopal over a prisoner's head. Eventually, the Reverend Sieur Blom, a veteran Congo missionary, reached the point where he had to go public. What he had come across went beyond anything he had ever imagined. His reports first appeared in a missionary magazine, but soon found their way into national newspapers in Europe. It was Sieur Blom's report that first revealed to the world the state practice of cutting off hands. When I crossed the stream, I saw some dead bodies hanging down from the branches in the water. As I turned my face away at the horrible sight, one of the native corporals who was following us down said, Oh, that's nothing. A few days ago, I returned from a fight, and I brought the white man 160 hands, and they were thrown into the river. That was about the time that I saw a native killed with my own eyes. The soldier said, Don't take it to heart so much. They kill us if we don't bring the rubber. The commissioner has promised us that if we have plenty of hands, he will shorten our service. 
I have brought in plenty of hands already, and I expect my service will soon be finished. Leopold's soldiers were being ordered to cut off the right hands of dead bodies. Each soldier was issued a fixed number of cartridges before a raid, and to prove to the white officers that he hadn't wasted any, the soldier had to bring back a cut hand for each cartridge that he'd fired. In each army unit, soldiers were designated to smoke the cut hands to preserve them. The hands were then taken to the officers to show that all the ammunition had been well used. On the 14th of December, 1895, Mr. Schurblum, Mrs. Banks and myself saw one of these sentries with a, a basket full of smoked hands. We got the sentry to stop and show us how many he had. He took them out of the basket and laid them in a row before us. Eighteen right hands of men, women and children. The sentry wanted to beat the woman who was carrying them for him, as he said there ought to be nineteen and she had lost one. Surely the King of the Belgians cannot be cognizant of these barbarous proceedings on the part of his servants. A confidential letter sent by a courtier to the chief executive of the Congo Free State revealed that Leopold was angry about being criticized for the cruelties in the Congo. But the letter also quotes the King as saying, I know that atrocities are being committed in the Congo. It is useless to try to deny it. I think one can assume that he knew, maybe not all the details, but that he knew that the system of exploitation of the rubber in the Congo uh, had uh, gruesome effects. The point is, did he consider it gruesome? Probably not. He thought this was the price that has to be paid for uh, economic development or whatever. He didn't care very much. He uh, thought that the profits were more important. Tango Mundela yaki na basuda na yepo na kubama biso na kima kina mo na nanga ya mobile na mapeka. Lisa si moko e lele la kinga ina litoi. Ezwa kinga ite kasi na kwe ina mabele. Tango na telemi na sundoli mo na nanga ipo na koka koki mambango. Tango na zongi na ndok na ndako. Ndeko nangai ya mobali ya zaleki kukumba mwana nangai na maboko. Basi kukata yelo boku moko na likolo. Na tika liko salisa ye. Antwerp was where the Congo rubber arrived. According to legend, the city's name comes from a confrontation between a Roman soldier and a giant who also cut off hands. Any connection between the city's symbol and cut hands in the Congo is seldom made in Antwerp. It's as though the crimes of the Congo are totally forgotten, or worse, never happened.
un bilan humain, rien ne l'exprime mieux qu'un adage des gens de l'Équateur. Beto Febole Iwo, le caoutchouc et la mort. En 1920, le Congo compte 10 millions d'habitants. Par rapport à 1880, c'est deux fois moins. Donc en 40 ans, le pays a perdu 10 millions de personnes globalement. Mais dans certaines localités, les pertes s'élèvent à 60, 70, 90 Donc le caoutchouc a été la catastrophe. Jamais les peuples du Congo n'avaient connu un désastre pareil. It was in the Equator province where many of the worst abuses occurred. Leopold had divided the Congo into separate districts, each under the control of a commissioner, most often recruited from and paid by the Belgian army. The Equator was run by an official who stands out as one of the great villains of the Congo Free State. Leon Fievé was a master in the use of violence to increase the rubber exports. He collected rubber in enormous quantities at a rate of one ton a day, it said. Common report on the Congo states that he caused more than 1,000 persons to be mutilated. It's also reported that he boasted of the cruelties, and certainly the result of them is evident to this day, for the people fled from the district in their thousands and have never returned. When General Wahis Governor General of the Congo made an official visit to the Equator region in 1896. Even he called it the land of horrors. Fieve had no qualms about the level of brutality. He perfectly understood that the state existed only to make money and that rubber was the key. For Leopold, Fieve was the perfect employee, loyal, efficient, and resourceful. Je réunis les chefs des villages voisins et leur ordonne de me rapporter un certain nombre de chikwang, du poisson, etc. Au jour convenu, pas de chikwang. Devant cette mauvaise volonté manifeste, je leur fais la guerre. Un exemple suffit, sans tête tranchée, et depuis lors, les vivres abondent dans la station. Mon but est en somme humanitaire. Je supprime sans existence, mais cela permet à 500 autres de vivre. mattered to Leopold was to keep up the supply of rubber. But to get the Congolese to work hard, he had to find a way to make his agents work hard as well. A confidential message went to the Governor General. Leopold was transmitting his greed to the agents. The state was going to pay commission to stimulate zeal. All the agents, well, the district commissars, to the last agent, Die kregen dus premies. Dus hoe meer rubber, hoe meer premies. Dus die mensen, omdat zij zagen dat men kon moorden en branden en plunderen en statistisch doen, zonder dat er enig gevolg aangegeven werd van hoger hand, zonder dat er enig onderzoek volgde of zonder resultaten, dan dacht men dat het allemaal toegelaten was. En het systeem was werkelijk uh, de wortel van alle kwaad. Daar ben ik volledig van overtuigd. Native life is considered of no value by the Belgians. No wonder the state is hated. They talk of philanthropy and civilization. Where it is, I do not know. The state has not suppressed slavery but established a monopoly by driving out the Arab competitors. This is no reasonable way of settling the land, it is merely persecution. <laughs> if the Arabs had been the masters, it would be styled iniquitous trafficking in human flesh and blood. 
but being under the administration of the Congo Free State, it is merely a part of liberating the natives. Charles Stokes, a British trader working for the Germans, was about to cause the king his first major political problem. Leopold was jealously guarding his trade in the Congo, completely against the agreements made with the European powers at Berlin. The king's orders were to enforce the monopoly fiercely. Stokes was arrested for trading in state territory and sentenced to death by Captain Hubert Lothair, an officer well known in the Congo. The people on the Lulanga River call him Lofembe. Some four years ago, he arrived with black troops and pitched his camp. He sent over to the missionary to use his influence to get the natives back. The missionary, supposing he was dealing with an officer and a gentleman, induced the natives to come to the station. As soon as they did so, Lothair and his men opened fire on them. The hanging was a major political mistake. Up till then, the victims of the Congo Free State had been African. There was outrage in Britain and Germany. In the end, the king had to pay compensation to both countries, and from now on, the European powers were increasingly wary of Leopold. To tear treasure out of the bowels of the land was their desire, with no more moral purpose at the back of it than there is in burglars breaking into a safe. Leopold's response to the pressure on him after the Stokes affair was very Leopold. He set up new concessions to exploit the rubber. He claimed he was opening the Congo to outsiders, but the king made sure his men were on the boards of the new companies and he took 50% of the profits. One of the concessions was given to Abir, the Anglo-Belgian rubber company at Bassan Kusu. Here, the rubber was dried before it was sent down river to be shipped to Antwerp, and the concession companies had found new ways of maximizing profit. Leopold's new companies were taking the wives of the rubber collectors hostage. The women were only released when sufficient rubber had been collected. The hostage system was organized by the concession companies with the full knowledge of the state and of the king himself. On official company forms, the names of the hostages were recorded along with the details of their condition and the length of time they were to be detained. The procedure was so institutionalized that each of the company's agents was given an official hostage license, authorizing them to detain women at will. Les femmes prises à la dernière palabre d'un coetra me donnent du fil à retordre. Tous les soldats voudraient en avoir une. Les sentinelles chargées de la surveillance des chaînes libèrent les plus jolies et les violent. When a missionary asked a chief how many women had been taken hostage, the chief replied, count the grains of sand, white man. Thank you. 
The moment of truth in Leopold's Congo Free State came once every 15 days when the rubber was handed in. The state talked about the rubber harvest and the rubber market, but the reality was completely different. For the collectors, this was when they would either get their wives back or face more punishment, even death, if they had not met their targets. For the agents, this was when they would be able to start calculating their commission. And for the king, this was the proof that his new concession companies worked and brought him even more wealth. En six ans, les profits nets s'élèvent à 720 000 livres pour un capital souscrit de 9 300 livres environ. Et l'action achetée 4 livres rapporte 335 livres. Mais le roi a un appétit d'ogre, insatiable. Il veut toujours plus. En fait, si le roi devient riche, la Belgique aussi devient riche. Donc ce que Léopold II transmet à la Belgique, ce n'est pas seulement le Congo. C'est aussi le système des compagnies concessionnaires, avec euh, toute leur force de corruption et aussi avec euh, tous les abus qui leur sont associés. Léopold's stranglehold on the rubber market lasted for over 10 years till the plantations of Asia and South America became serious competition. The profits all went to Belgium, but how much remains in the hands of the royal family today is still a matter of speculation. Leopold once said about his Congo, what I do there is done as a Christian duty to the poor Africans, and I do not wish to have one franc back of all the money I have expended. As the 20th century began, King Leopold found himself facing the first major challenge to his rule in Africa, and it came from London. En 1900, paraît dans The Speaker une série d'articles qui constituent un événement. L'auteur, visiblement très bien informé, avance des faits des certitudes, pas des insinuations. Le coup est très bien joué parce que les articles sont anonymes, ce qui suscite une curiosité générale. Qui est l'auteur Que veut-il L'auteur de ces articles, c'est Edmund Dean Morrell. Edmund Dean Morrell is one of history's most underestimated heroes. He rose from being a shipping clerk to Leopold's foremost adversary. He didn't have Leopold's royal pedigree, but in everything else, morale was more than a match for the king. A Liverpool shipping line handled Leopold's rubber cargoes, and Morel got his first job there. But he soon became a leading journalist on West African affairs. Because he's working in the West African trade, he specializes in West African news. So he's somebody who becomes a specialist and expert in West and Central African affairs. And when he becomes chief clerk to the Congo business, he's somebody who does a lot of to and froing between Antwerp and Liverpool, because Antwerp is where a great deal of the Congo trade is unloaded. At Antwerp docks, Morel started unraveling the truth about Leopold's Congo. He described it as stumbling upon a secret society of murderers. Morel est un expert du commerce colonial. Il est le premier à travailler sur les documents officiels de l'État indépendant du Congo et à faire parler ses propres statistiques. Avec lui, la protestation morale contre Léopold II cède la place à l'analyse du système et une analyse implacable. Puisque l'argent n'entre pas au Congo comme investissement ou comme salaire, une seule chose peut expliquer les quantités de caoutchouc et d'ivoire qui augmentent. Cette chose, le cœur du système léopoldien, c'est le travail forcé. Morel moved to Harden in Wales, left his job at the shipping line and began a personal campaign against the king. In six months, he sent out 15,000 brochures and 3,700 letters. 
Within a year, Morel had his own newspaper, the West African Mail. Now he could get his message to an even wider audience. From his offices in Liverpool, Morel gathered together all the stories he could about the events in the Congo. And he set about trying to enlist the missionaries' help. But since the first wave of outbursts against Leopold, the missionaries had gone silent. They had the evidence, they had the details, they had the stories that were going to grab popular imagination and that were going to make the campaign take off. But selfishly, the missionary societies didn't want these stories circulated because they didn't want to offend Leopold. They felt if they were critical at all, they would be thrown out, and that meant that they wouldn't achieve their ultimate end, which was the, the maximum conversion of African souls. I think they had a rather mechanistic view of what they were doing. And one soul converted was one step nearer the second coming, if you like. And if those converted souls were subsequently mutilated or murdered, well, so be it. They died Christians. So, so what? Step by step, Morel persuaded the missionaries to come forward with articles for his West African mail. One of the first was Charles Banks from the Equator region. We heard a report that the state soldiers had attacked the village of Bandakawajiko because the rubber was not of the best quality. In a little shed lay one of my late school children, a promising young lad. I lifted the leaves by which he was covered and saw that his right hand had been cut off. I then went through the village and saw the people burying their dead. I counted over 20 bodies and newly filled graves. All the bodies had the right hand cut off. Morel recherche l'efficacité. Pour réussir, il a besoin de tout le monde, de toutes les forces morales, spirituelles, matérielles. Alors, peu importe ses propres convictions religieuses, il a besoin des missionnaires, il les gagne à sa cause. Peu importe ses idées sociales, il a besoin des hommes d'affaires, il les rallie à lui. En réunissant tout ce monde autour de lui, il se révèle un très habile tacticien politique. Seven thousand miles away, Morel now had a new ally. A stream of letters arrived at the Foreign Office in London. The British government had appointed a consul to Leopold's Congo Free State, and the new consul was outraged. Captain Van Kerkhoven told me that he used to pay his native soldiers five brass rods per human head they brought him in during the course of any military operations. The consul was Roger Casement, a man with 20 years of African experience. Casement is a hugely romantic figure. He's somebody rather like Lawrence of Arabia. But he's someone who I think one could say was probably a generation or a generation and a half ahead of his time in terms of his attitude towards the Africans. He said himself that, that he loved the Africans. He liked them. He liked their company. He wanted them to be friends. They liked him. He was someone who treated Africans with much more gentility, with much more consideration than was usual for the time. In 1903, Casement spent two months traveling into the Upper Congo. Morel's campaign had pressured the British government into conducting an official investigation. Wherever Casement went, he talked to Africans and recorded their testimony. Mondele Azalaki Koloba Nabasuda Baye Bozali Kobomaka Kabasi Kasi Mibalite Bola Kisate Bozali Koboma Pi Mibali Tango Bazalaki Kobete Biso Masasi Bazalaki Kobete Morel 
bomi mibali. Casement realized, as had Morel, that the missionaries were the key witnesses, and he wanted to persuade them to go public with what they knew. He visited the town of Ikoko on Lake Tumba, where the missionary Joseph Clark lived. <laughs> Joseph Clark was known to the Africans then and now as Pebby. He had been in the Congo for over 20 years. Clark and his wife supplied evidence and witnesses of the state's atrocities. Casement stayed with them for 17 days. The villagers of Ikoko still have to use the same school and church that Joseph Clark built for them a hundred years ago. On a beach by Lake Tumba, Casement recorded how a boy had both his hands beaten off by soldiers while a white officer known as Ika Tankoy, the leopard's paw, stood by. The white man, Ika Tankoy, was not far off and could see what they were doing. Ika Tankoy was drinking palm wine while the soldiers beat the boy's hands off with their rifle butts against a tree. The boy's name was Mola. Morel published his photograph in the West African Mail. Casement was so horrified by everything that he'd seen that on the day he left for England, he delivered a vitriolic letter to the Governor General, knowing full well that meant that he would never be allowed to return. From the earliest days of the Congo Free State, book after book had appeared, regaling readers with tales of the horrors to be found there. Others, like Stanley, had told a different story. But the king was facing a mounting tide of criticism. A war of words started. Leopold commissioned books and bribed journalists. He established propaganda offices in Brussels, Frankfurt, and America to defend his regime. He published a monthly magazine that was circulated around Europe. Morale fought back, and now he had another secret to reveal. The West African Mail 
published a report on a part of the Congo that no one had known even existed. Soudainement, au plus fort des accusations contre l'État indépendant du Congo, on apprend l'existence de l'autre côté du lac Tumba, à 100 km d'ici, du domaine de la Couronne. Ce domaine, propriété privée à l'intérieur de la propriété personnelle du roi, a été créé en 1896, mais son existence a été tenue secrète jusqu'en 1902. The Crown Domain, 10 times the size of Belgium, was completely sealed off. But a missionary had managed to get in. Morel got hold of his journal and published the atrocities committed by Charles Massard, a Belgian officer known to the Africans as Malu Malu. The white man, Malu Malu, I feel ashamed of my color every time I think of him, would stand at the door of the store to receive the rubber from the poor, trembling wretches. One man bringing in under the proper amount. The white man flies into a rage and seizing a rifle from one of the guards, shoots him dead on the spot. The men who had tried to run from the country and had been caught were brought to the station and made to stand one behind the other as an Albini bullet was sent through them. A pity to waste bullets on such wretches. Some of the stories are unprintable, and much that I heard would not pass muster in court. But there were too many witnesses, and the consistencies were too many for it all to be lies. Baron Jules Jacques is a Belgian hero of the First World War. In Leopold's time, he was one of the men that the king trusted to run the crown domain. His behavior is well illustrated in a memo that is kept by the Belgian Foreign Ministry, but which is officially a secret document to this day. Monsieur le chef de poste, décidément ces gens d'Inongo constituent une bien vilaine engeance. Ils sont venus couper les liens à caoutchouc à Ibali. Nous devrons taper sur eux jusqu'à soumission absolue ou extinction complète. Prévenez-les que s'ils coupent encore une liane, je les exterminerai tous. Jusqu'au dernier. Leopold's personal profit from his crown domain was 231 million euros. As the movement against Leopold gathered momentum, Morel decided to turn up the pressure. Liverpool became the headquarters of the new Congo Reform Association. Lorsqu'en 1904, Morel fonde l'Association pour la réforme du Congo, il vient de lancer le premier mouvement humanitaire du XXe siècle, dont il va faire d'ailleurs une formidable machine pour soulever l'opinion. C'est lui qui, à partir de Liverpool, va l'étendre sur toute la Grande-Bretagne. C'est grâce à ses efforts que le mouvement va déborder sur le continent européen. C'est encore lui qui va l'implanter aux États-Unis et en faire un mouvement transatlantique. Donc, grâce à Morel, l'Association pour la réforme du Congo devient une gigantesque coalition absolument irrésistible. Morel's Congo Reform Association took the cruelty of Leopold's Congo to public meetings across the country. A hymn was especially composed. Britons, awake, let righteous ire kindle within your soul a fire. Let indignation's sacred flame burn for the Congo's wrongs and shame. He was a genius propagandist. He really dragged the issue to the center of the international stage. 
had the brilliant idea in 1906, when his book Red Rubber was published, of putting on the front of it a picture drawn from the Egyptian Book of the God of souls being weighed in the scales. And in one pan of the scales, they had a picture of Leopold in all of his regal regalia. And on the other side, they had a simple black hand, a severed hand. And that's an extraordinary symbol, really, of a, of a movement. That is, that is really how to imprint something on people's understanding, to sum it all up in a single image. And so I think that, you know, he really is one of the fathers of, of investigative journalism and of pressure group politics and of 20th century humanitarianism. Morel was waiting for the publication of Casement's report. When it came, he was not disappointed. The report ran for over 50 pages. The British Foreign Secretary called it proof of the most painful kind. For Leopold, the report was a fatal blow. Ce haut fonctionnaire britannique ne se contente pas d'établir la preuve des atrocités. Il montre que ces atrocités font partie d'un système qui, par sa durée dans le temps, son étendue dans l'espace et sa répétition est très certainement le pire des systèmes coloniaux que l'Afrique ait connu. The casement report so unnerved the king that he made a serious mistake. In 1904, he sent his own international commission to the Congo to investigate. He thought he could control what they said. He was wrong. He hadn't counted on the determination of one man, John Harris, a missionary at Baringa. Harris and his wife had set up a mission right in the heart of a concession area. Every day they saw the crimes that were being committed against the Congolese. As a result, Harris was waging his own war against the state. To His Excellency the Vice Governor General, I have just returned from a journey inland to the village of Nsongo Umboyo. The abject misery and utter abandon is positively indescribable. A few months ago, Monsieur Pillet took his sentries there. A young woman, Imanega, was tied to a forked tree and chopped in half with a machete. Beginning at her left shoulder, chopping through the chest and abdomen and out of the side. It was in this way the sentries punished the woman's husband. Another woman, Bolumba, wishing to remain faithful to her husband, had a pointed stake forced into her womb, and as this did not kill her, she was shot. I found that, as in other towns, enforced public incest formed amusement for the sentries. I was so moved, Your Excellency, by these people's stories that I took the liberty of promising them in the name of the Congo Free State that in future you will only kill them for crimes. Baringa, then and now, was at the end of the earth. The Harrises set up a hospital that still struggles on. Then, like now, the missionaries dealt with the impact of war, terror, and deprivation. Then, like now, they faced the scourge of sleeping sickness. In Harris's day, the Congo was torn apart for its rubber. Now, it's ravaged for diamonds, gold, and other minerals. The result for the Congolese is the same. Generations of pain. A whole archaeology of oppression. A hundred years ago, two steamers came to Baringa. On board were judges, secretaries, state officials and soldiers. 
Leopold's international commission had arrived. The commission judges had been carefully chosen by the king to ensure that the outcome would be in his favor. But John Harris had gathered a host of Congolese witnesses to testify. As the judges listened to their evidence, Leopold's plans were coming unstuck. The villagers were confirming the truth of Casement and Morel's accusations. And worse still for the king, Harris had made arrangements for the evidence to be published by Morel. For three months, Leopold's commission collected the evidence for their report. One incident stands out. Lontulu, a chief from a village near Baringa, arrived unannounced. He brought with him 110 twigs. Each twig represented one of his villagers killed by the state. As he laid the twigs in front of the judges, he named each twig. Wato, chef Yembe, Kumu Yang, Kumu Mai, Kumu Binzo, Mwana Kwang. The state never forgave Lontulu, and some weeks later, he was tortured to death. But when the commission finally left the Congo, the governor general committed suicide. He slit his throat with a razor. When John Harris came back to England, the journalist W.T. Stead asked him if Leopold should be hanged at the new International Court of Justice at The Hague. Harris replied, I think any international tribunal which had powers of a criminal court would, upon the evidence of the commission alone, send those responsible to the gallows. Well, the idea of one of the great perpetrators of European colonialism and one of the perpetrators of U U European colonialism at its most callous and unpleasant being brought before an international court is, I have to admit, not an unattractive one. Uh, and I suppose what, we, what we're seeing at this time, and of course it's, that, it's part and parcel of this, this, this new imperialism, this crude, heavy-handed, aggressive, violent imperialism, is criticism in the worst. One is seeing the development of an international radical movement. And people like Stead and people like Morel are the beginnings of a movement which eventually will produce the League of Nations and the UN. And it would be attractive to think that Leopold could have been an early victim, but unthinkable, I think, at the time.
The Commission's report had vindicated casement and morale, and when it was published, it even had an effect in Belgium. Leopold had tried to make it as anodyne as possible, but he had failed. For the first time, Belgian intellectuals and religious leaders came out openly against the king. There was a real chance of annexation that Belgium would take over control of the Congo. Morel watched eagerly as step by step the king's reign in the Congo was drawing to its end. Red Rubber was published in 1906. Morel knew the king was isolated. Belgian annexation of the Congo was inevitable, but Morel was still pushing. He wanted the change to happen now. We demand that this shall stop. Not 15 years, or five years, or one year hence, but now. Almost as an admission of guilt, Leopold ordered the burning of all incriminating Congo state records. C'est tout de même bizarre, cet homme qui dit il n'a rien à cacher et qui détruit toutes les traces de son action. Est-ce qu'il n'y avait pas des choses qu'il voulait absolument arracher et à tout jamais à des regards indiscrets Une chose est sûre, pour les historiens, c'est une catastrophe. Mais pour ses défenseurs, c'est du pain béni que cette destruction volontaire. Ils auront toujours beau jeu et ils ont beau jeu de répondre aux critiques de Léopold II, apporter les preuves de ce que vous dites, les preuves que Léopold II a détruites. Right to the end, the king insisted that the Congo was his and his alone, but no one was listening anymore. In 1908, the Congo became a Belgian colony. Belgium gave the king 50 million francs as a mark of gratitude. Leopold died the following year. He had asked for a private funeral, but he lost that request too. At the funeral, his cortege was booed as it passed. Leopold, by the end of his reign, had become the most hated man in Europe. It seemed that justice had been done. Leopold's statues are in reality monuments to a nation's denial. Despite being put in place after the king had died in disgrace, he is unashamedly represented as a civilizer and benefactor. C'est remarquable qu'après sa mort, une nouvelle image de Léopold II émerge et avec elle, une histoire entièrement remodelée. Dans cette nouvelle histoire, qui est patriotique, se trouvent mélangées trois choses. Le roi Léopold II, devenu l'objet d'un véritable culte national. La Belgique, en tant que nation, soudée derrière son roi. Et le Congo, devenu enfin une colonie de la Belgique. Almost as soon as the Congo became Belgian, the new owners began preaching their colonial gospel. The litany of how Belgium was bringing civilization, turning a wilderness into paradise, was repeated over and over to willing listeners. Können wij in België gaan nu op een eerlijke manier profiteren op iets wat oneerlijk is tot stand gekomen? Dat kon ook niet. Dus en. Daarom moesten wij met een mooie kolonie op een gezonde morele basis kunnen vertrekken. And the new Belgian Congo made financial sense. There were diamonds, gold and a whole host of minerals that Belgium could exploit. Leopold, before giving up the Congo to Belgium, had set up a giant mineral exploitation industry. Why shouldn't Belgium take advantage of that? and enjoy the profits without any of the guilt. 
Belgians could feel comfortable knowing their investments in the Congo were for a good cause and enjoying the returns without shame. Africans were being civilized and Belgium was getting richer. Leopold had been right all along. Le Congo colonial, économiquement prospère, avec ses Noirs heureux et reconnaissant envers la Belgique, c'est une légende inventée de toutes pièces. Car on a mis au point une stratégie consistant à rendre propre l'argent du Congo, à assimiler les intérêts de la Belgique et ceux du Congo, et surtout à nier le passé, à l'occulter et à le faire oublier. C'était exactement ce que Léopold II avait voulu. Cette stratégie a réussi, a très bien réussi, pendant la colonisation et même après la colonisation. Car il a fallu quelques cent ans pour que, enfin, remonte à la surface tous les secrets peu reluisants sur la colonisation au Congo. In the years since the Congo Reform Association, Casement and Morel have also sunk into the Congo amnesia. Casement became an Irish nationalist and was executed by the British for plotting with the Germans in the First World War. Morel's pacifist views made him deeply unpopular and he too was accused of pro-German sympathies. Morel and Casement did both become, in the, in the course of the First World War, associated with Germany. They were seen as tainted figures. And I think that's one reason that, that actually the quite heroic achievements of the Congo Reform Association have been forgotten. I think the other reason it's been forgotten is that the Congolese themselves have, have not had the power or the leverage on the international stage in the way that Jews have, in the way that black Americans have, to push the Congo as one of the world's great holocausts. The bloody history of the Congo has continued. Since 1998, perhaps as many as four million people have died there during a civil war. Before that, a cruel dictatorship imposed by the West. Before that, colonization. The UN regularly issues reports on how the country is still being exploited. Yet another homage paid to Leopold in Brussels. This one put up just a few years ago. Leopold would be proud. As far as we know, nowhere in the surviving records of his reign or of his Congo Free State is there ever an admission of guilt or a scintilla of remorse. But who will ever know what was going on in his mind in 1909 as he lay dying? I saw on that ivory face the expression of somber pride, of ruthless power, of craven terror, of an intense and hopeless despair. Did he live his life again in every detail of desire, temptation and surrender during that supreme moment of complete knowledge? He cried in a whisper at some image, at some vision. He cried out twice, a cry that was no more than a breath. The horror. The horror.